Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. is Indian Country Today. As one of four indigenous bushfellows this year, Jody Rave Spotted Bear is working with independent media to help Native nations on issues affecting tribal sovereignty. As founder of the Indigenous Media Freedom Alliance, Spotted Bear is working to elevate the people's voice and to promote accountability of tribal governments. Welcome and congratulations, Jody. Hi, Mark, thank you. So tell us about your fellowship. Well, <laughs> that's a pretty broad question. Uh, right now, we're in the, in the process of developing our leadership plan. And originally, when we were submitted our plan, I had thought I would do a one-year program. But there's really a, an incredible amount of opportunities for leadership and for training. And so I've, I've just recently expanded it to a two year program. And that's the phase that we're in with the fellowship at, at this point, looking at classes and programs and community groups that we can work with. And it's it's really been a, a wonderful phase to be, to have all these, opportunities and possibilities opened. Do you, do you get a chance to talk with your colleagues about projects they're working on and how they match or how they're different? Uh, what kind of project? Oh, you mean colleagues within the Bush Foundation? The Bush, yeah. Yeah, well, we just had our retreat about two weeks ago and that was really, I guess may, maybe closer to three weeks, but that was the first time that we all got to meet together and to talk about our, our plans and our and our ideas. And, and that's really when, yeah, I did get to hear what they're working on. And we, I think we're all in a phase of, of being a little bit overwhelmed by maybe thinking too, um, not thinking big enough are really having these opportunities open up to us, hearing each other's ideas about what we could actually be doing and, and raising that bar higher for ourselves. Speaking of raising the bar higher, uh, you've done a lot of research and a lot of writing about tribes, accountability in the press. Uh, first, what's it like to operate uh, in a tribal community with that kind of standard? And how do you see it going forward? Well, you know, Mark, I worked my entire career in the in the mainstream media. And for as, as much as I, I love my work, and I think you're you've been in that phase uh, many times yourself. We love what we do. We love being a journalist. We love telling the news, telling those stories and during my my time with Lee Enterprises, you know, I, I often thought I just had a really awesome job and I, I did, but there was also a point where you realize, you know, there's it's time to time to move on and and fulfill some of these other dreams and, and visions that you that you have. And for me, I had always wanted to return home to the Fort Berthold Reservation. You know, this is the land that I grew up on and this is where my family is. It's our ancestral territory. And so I just knew I had to come back. And, and since I've been back, I'm really learning that you're not doing, journalism isn't <laughs> what it was in the mainstream. And I'd often reported at home 
about issues at home, tribal politics and et cetera. And it's a lot different when you're, you're living here locally. And so part of the Bush Foundation is really helping me to transform my leadership in and working more at the community local level. And that, that's a whole new ball game. Part of that mission, and something certainly both Bush and the Native Governance Center have worked on, is to educate tribal leaders. And including that would be how to manage the press, how to be uh, transparent, how to, I guess, basically govern more effectively using that medium. You know, I've, I've uh, really been a student of, of the Native Nations program. I've used their, used their teachings on you know, tribal constitutions. I've taught that at the tribal college. I've gone into the communities and, and talked about these very issues. And that is, you know, when we talk about tribal sovereignty, there's, there's three pillars. You know, it's the tribe's right to govern itself. I just had a flashback to your uh, <laughs> your famous response to uh, George Bush, but you know it's a, the right of a tribe to govern themselves, and tribal sovereignty is protecting our our sacred spaces and places. But there's that third pillar that Vine Deloria reminds us of, and that is and that tribal sovereignty is also taking care of your your people and 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 being a voice for the people and so that's really the work that i envision for the indigenous media freedom alliance and buffalo's fire to do is is to fulfill that third pillar and to be a voice of the people and to listen to what the people are saying which is why yesterday i i spent all day going up to newtown here on the reservation and and meeting with uh with a a cultural community leader and and that's really the direction that I see the Bush Fellowship going is getting down to that local level and really listening to what the people are are saying what their needs are and and being that that voice and and providing that third pillar of sovereignty that's a great point to end on thank you so much Jody Rave Spotted Bear thank you Thanks for inviting me, Mark. And we'll be right back. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. The Bush Fellowship provides up to $100,000 over 12 to 24 months. This resource sets up fellows to pursue education and learning experiences. Those experiences help them develop the skills and relationships that may foster long, large scale change in communities and in the region. Interesting to note, this is one of the largest fellowships of its kind in the country. On today's show, we'll be speaking with some of this year's Indigenous Fellows. From tribal sovereignty to health and education, these Bush Fellows are working to imagine new systems and transform existing ones. Ki Mimila Locke is on a quest to radically improve educational outcomes for Lakota youth. Over the past two decades, she has embedded culture and community strengths in learning to help students achieve significant academic results. She is returning to Standing Rock to open a high school that embraces Lakota traditions. She'll be working to create safe spaces that reconnect indigenous youth to their land and to the strengths of their culture. Welcome, Kimi Mela. Oh, well, thank you for having me. So this is fantastic. Uh, maybe talk about your plans for the next uh, going forward. So I'm, I'm literally creating a self-study in radical sovereignty. 
And <clears throat> the way I'm envisioning or I'm, up, yeah, actually it's application. It's no longer vision. Ah, I'm still downloading that idea. But the way that I'm applying this or this um, learn, this self-study is one to actually live it by um, investing my time and a lot of the energy that I've actually been doing kind of as, as my side, uh, you know, like as my side job or, yeah. Um, but a lot of my time is the Mini Wichwani Nakichize Wo Unspe, which is the school that was started during the No Dapo resistance camp. And we're literally trying to recreate um, a, a sustainable structure, a sustainable system, but fashioned after the same idea that where students were engaged in the community, working um, with community leaders. Like if there was a buffalo butchering, they were there doing that. If they, you know, so creating a similar system that we can actually live that and, and do that with the students. And I also want to learn and align and um, collaborate with um, other indigenous peoples who are engaged in radical sovereignty. And some of the ideas that I'm proposing is, you know, to go and learn from the Maori, immersion, immersion, Maori language immersion schools in New Zealand, or to learn, you know, like this, the way the, if up in, um, where is it? In Yukon territory and in British Columbia, they take students out for two weeks on the land and you know they they have them learn their quote unquote standards, but it's through the culture. So I want to learn how how these indigenous peoples are able to exercise sovereignty despite whatever colonized structure is you know is 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 that they're answering to or that they're trying to abide by, but still exercising and believing that we as indigenous peoples are intelligent and capable enough of educating our own young people. We can do it. So that's kind of, I mean, and I have a, a number of other ideas, but that's kind of the gist of where, where I want to go with, you know, with this um, amazing opportunity. Well, the phrase uh, radical sovereignty brings to me a lot of things, but one that almost immediately is if we're talking about a 10,000 year history, colonial sovereignty versions have only been around for an inch. And you're actually returning to the norm in that sense, to a much longer story. Really, really trying to do that, exactly. I mean, even down to, we have a building that's underway, that's they're bringing in the shovels next week, not shovels, whatever they're bringing. That's how much I know about construction. They're bringing in the, the stuff to be, begin our building that is, um, solar pow powered and will eventually be comp um, compost toilets and gray water system. So it's, it's literally be off grid. <sighs> I get so excited when I think about all the developments. <laughs> what, what do you hope that students take away from this? What's the first goal? Um, I feel so I as an as a person who has been in the you know public school system you know I spent 17 years as a classroom teacher um, and what I saw there is people you know what or what the school system does is really have tell people what they need to learn and how they should be learning it and as indigenous people before you know, before the school system was here, you couldn't tell us how to teach our young people. So ultimately, the young people will be, uh, you know, guiding them. They'll, they'll be saying, I want to learn this. And, you know, as this nest, as this, you know, like fortress we're trying to create for the young people, we'll say, cool, let me help you. Let me help you with that. I know this elder, I know this um, specialist that, you know, this person that specialized in that knowledge, let me connect you with them. And we, you know, we have academic specialists who will, you know, help them actually apply the state standards, which are the most, you know, basic. And then, you know, also while also le learning the indigenous standards, which are the universal standards. Well, and in a way, I mean, you think about so much of education is about limits and what you can't do. And this turns that around and says, what if you didn't have those limits? What can you do? What can you do? The world is your classroom. So it's really, you know, like trying to get, um, look at the nobility of each person and look at their, their gifts and really harness that and really hone in on that. And 
ultimately, so it's like that taking that whole Maslow's, um, the Blackfoot, however you're, you know, if you're whatever uh, historical framework you're working from, the Blackfoot um, hierarchy of need and flipping it so that all the needs are met, therefore people automatically will begin to self-actualize and, you know, see their, their power and their, their brilliance as opposed to you're not standing in the line correctly. You're, you're writing way out of the lines, you know? So yeah, just really looking at the beauty of each person. One of the, we only have about a minute left, but one of the things that's always struck me when I've been able to visit communities across, uh, really across all of North America is how much talent there is. And this is a way to recognize that talent and say, go. Yep, exactly. That's the goal. That's the goal. What are you most optimistic about as you start this? The, the ideas, the ideas that I had, that I and others have had, they're re becoming reality. <laughs> that still blows me away. Like, the, yeah, it's not an idea anymore. It's not a what if. It's how much are you going to spend and when are you going? What? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that still, I'm still wrapping my brain around that. That's kind of amazing. What's first? Um, first, the school is opening. So in the fall, I'm going to be, you know, focused on, on actually living it, living radical sovereignty, living, say, you know, what we've been saying, doing. Um, as soon as the borders open up, I do want to, I, you know, I kind of want to scoot out and get to Canada, get to New Zealand, work with some of the um, Indigenous peoples in, in northern, New, more northern Mexico, as well as the Yucatan Peninsula. So yeah, as soon as I can, I want to, you know, start kind of be traveling as well. But first and foremost, radical sovereignty on my homelands with our young people, you know, opening the school, living, living it, doing it, being it. That's the first. Thank you so much, Ki Mimi La. Thank you for having me. When we come back, more Bush Fellows and the ways they're working to shape Native American communities. Natalie Nicholson is from the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation. She understands the persistence required to achieve a dream. She's a former Olympian and world camp champion curler, also a first-generation college student. As a nurse, she co-leads the Indigenous Breastfeeding Coalition in Minnesota to help reestablish a traditional breastfeeding support network for Indigenous families and caregivers. Nicholson wants to address health disparities in Native populations by providing culturally specific healthcare service for indigenous people. Welcome, Natalie, and congratulations. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get into it. Um, tell us about your project. Uh, the Bush Fellowship um, is just a, a wonderful opportunity. The foundation provides um, scholar fellowship funding to support um, communities, uh, leaders, and um, allows us the ability to identify what we need or feel that we need personally to grow and develop as um, an individual to in turn have that ripple in our communities. So you're focusing on healthcare, and one of the things that um, is always interesting to me when we talk to policymakers is that few people understand that most of the Indian healthcare system now is run by tribes and tribal organizations. And there's really a lot of innovation going on in terms of how services are carried out. Uh, what, tell me about the focus of your project. So the focus of my project is really based around my own personal growth and development to become, uh, I think, a better leader. 
um, to understand the complexities of the healthcare system and to really take that funding and use it towards finishing up my doctorate in nursing practice program. And then to also connect with other indigenous cultural leaders and healers in the United States and abroad, if possible, it really is dependent upon travel restrictions and things like that. But I really um, am looking to, to look at that cultural health and wellness and, um, and would love to be able to offer more integrative healthcare services with Western medicine as I'm clinically trained with cultural health and wellness uh, with, with my mom and our nonprofit organization. So that often starts with a question. What, what's the big question you wanna answer? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a question I wanna answer. Like sometimes it's really a matter of taking the time to, to explore that and this fellowship provides that opportunity. Um, I have a, a broad plan that I think I know, but as I've, my experiences have come like, there's so many things that come out of experiences that you can't ever plan for. And I think I'm really, really excited to have that opportunity to meet other people and learn from them and to process it, what it means um, for myself and then also for my community. I really believe healthcare has to have, be led culturally and it has to be led from the communities. And we sort of see that when uh, folks have a choice about whether to go to an Indian health system provider or an outside provider, they do pick the culturally relevant one just for that reason. Absolutely. It really embodies like who we are as people. Um, you know, healthcare in general is evolving. There's lots of different practices within it in itself, whether it's Western medicine, holistic medicine, complementary. There's so many avenues within healthcare, but uh, I'm really excited to connect with our communities and to have them also give me input and guidance on what it looks like for them of what they want in a healthcare facility for themselves. It really should be grounded in that and native led and guided that way and being able to facilitate that, that type of system. How important is for, um the community and I guess the patient to decide what's important to them. It, it's, you know, it's the most important, I think, I think because, you know, if, if it's not something that people are identifying with or that they're not feeling that in affiliation with, or it's not connecting with them, it doesn't matter what we say or do as providers if it doesn't work for our families. And so we have to listen better and do what our families are telling us that they need and then provide that and facilitate that for them. So, so much of Western medicine is about really fixing something that's wrong. And uh, if you take the broader view, it's about the whole experience of a person. Um, how, how does that translate when you talk to communities? I think it's a matter of asking really important questions, open-ended questions, and then really listening and having more than one listening session or, you know, it takes time to develop those relationships with communities. Um, you have to be participative in the, in the community um, and show general, genuine interest in making things better um, and giving acknowledgement and credit that there's always been people doing important work in Indian country um, that isn't published, that people are not, you know, essentially publishing things, um, our communities know what they need. And so it's time for us to be responsive as providers to provide what they need, what people need. And again, so much of the Western idea of medicine tends to start with questions about food and uh, language and other uh, cultural norms. How important is that in your conversations? Yeah, I mean, everything relates to one another. I mean, with, to not have that conversation is really leaving out an important piece. I think everything is connected. We know this, it's part of our culture. Um, and so it takes collaboration though. And for me, I would love to see more partnerships in our communities um, with Western and you know our culture to making things better. I, 
I would love to see partnership with our indigenous food systems. Um, more talk is being done with that. It's just a matter of putting things better into action and, and collaboration and just getting the work processed and move forward. Where do you start as you do something this huge? It's a good question. You know, the foundation has done a really nice job of helping us process that. Um, they've provided us with really good guidelines and kind of questions for us to process and understand. For me, it looks a little bit different. I have one year left of my doctorate in nursing practice program. So I'm looking at completing that and wrapping that up over the next year. I'm also doing um, some work with our indigenous breastfeeding coalition and looking at breastfeeding as one of the first foods and encouraging that in our communities. And so um, it just takes time. It, it takes patience and it's something I need to grow better with. Natalie Nich Nicholson, we look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Join us again tomorrow and online at IndianCountryToday.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.